guys um, have asked me here to talk about human output, and um, I'm just calling it, telling you stories about my climbing adventures. Um, it's going to be fun. I want to put it in perspective for you. I want to tell you about the place I climb. Um, and what's really challenging is you guys are going to only give me 14 and a half minutes to do that. Um, you know, some people are scared, terrified, right, to get on stage and speak. I am terrified that I only get 14 minutes with you. <laughs> I want more. Um, so I am going to have to speak quite possibly as fast as I climb. So let's get with it here. Um, got a short amount of time. This is my playground or my laboratory for human output, right? It is the second most beautiful place on the planet. That's right. <laughs> Chapel Hill, of course, right? Uh, so, <laughs> Yosemite is the big wall center of the world. Um, that means they have these huge, giant walls to climb, right? On the back right there, you have Half Dome, uh, probably the most photographed and recognized rock in the world. But up front in the left is El Capitan. It's one and a half times the height of Half Dome. Um, like I said, uh, Yosemite is totally beautiful. You, I, I get to do business talks and you get to tell this metaphor that's real. You climb and hike through the clouds and you get the view down on the clouds. It is just amazing, right? So I want to tell you about, and it's easy to see why people flock here for not just the climbing but just the views, right? The scenic beauty. Well, climbers, and climbers, how long have they been there climbing in Yosemite, right? They've been there since long before the white man's been there, but the earliest stories we have are John Muir in the late 1800s climbing things like Cathedral Peak and Tuolumne Meadows, right? And these shots here you're seeing are from 1950, 1960. And you see, we didn't have EMS, we didn't have Blue Ridge Mountain Sports, we didn't have REI back in the 50s and 60s. And I say we, I wasn't actually born until the 60s. But these guys were going to junkyards and sawing the legs off of stoves and pounding them in cracks. They were going to the Army surplus stores and buying duffel bags, right, and just making it up. Here, I love this shot. This is 1961. He's got a motor oil can. That's what they carried their water up the walls with, right? Totally amazing. But something hasn't changed in 60 plus years. In his other hand, he has a chocolate bar. Pretty neat. And I'm going to leave the name off of what type. Um, so this is El Cap, right? One and a half times that of Half Dome. Um, let's put something in perspective. Half Dome is a big wall, right? But two thirds the height of this. It was not ascended until three years after Everest was first ascended. We're talking about the grand prize of all climbing, right? Everest was ascended three years before Half Dome. Well, Warren Harding, no relation to the President Harding, congratulated these guys on top of Half Dome because he wasn't in the team and patently said, I got to come down and do something to beat you guys, supposedly. And he said, I'm going to climb El Cap, which we knew was impossible to climb at that time. This is in the 50s, right? And let's get a perspective here. This is the Transamerica building. Approximately two and a half of those on top of each other could go by El Cap. It's 1,200 feet tall. And I got your local here, um, 170 feet, right? You could stack this 17 times on top of itself and it would be the height of El Cap. Totally amazing, right? So we have the nose route. Warren Harding um, went up this in 1958. Well, it took five days to climb Half Dome. After five days of work, Warren got to the first bend in this blue line. After 33 days of work, spread out, of 18, out over 18 months, he got two-thirds of the way up the wall. The Park Service said, hey, you've got to take all these ropes and gear and red wine down from El Cap. <laughs> And that's probably why he didn't get ahead. And you got to get off there. So he went on November 1st, 1958, and spent 12 more days on the route with George Whitmore and Wayne Mary, and they summited. And this is now the most famous big wall route in the world. It's called a grade six route, because to this day, a competent party should plan approximately six days to climb it. This season, people will come to Yosemite. Hundreds of teams will come to Yosemite, and one third of them will not be able to ascend it. They'll turn back around. Those that do summit will take three days to climb this wall, on average. 
Um, we got to remember that something as simple as a wedge-shaped piece of metal on the right did not exist in the 50s or early 60s. They were hammering pitons in. So this is a, like if we're talking about human ap output in a laboratory, this is our centrifuge and our beakers. You know, what did we have to test ourselves, right, in Yosemite? Um, now we have camelots, right? These stick in cracks with the pull of a trigger. It slots in. It will hold a VW bus, which is, of course, climber's car of choice, right? And <laughs> pull of a trigger and it's out. Compare that to hammering 15 or 20 times a pin in, and not only hammering it in, but now the person who follows you has to hammer it out. Um, so much easier with these devices we have now. So what else changed in the last 50 years? There was no such thing as climbing gyms, right, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even 80s. This happens to be one in downtown San Francisco, but now the culture is supporting climbing, right, so much so that we actually have competitions. So I think we got a clip here, and yes, of course we're going to show a clip of me climbing uh, in the X Games. X Games picked this up, right? ESPN? <laughs> yeah, the guy in the head is me on the left, right? So it's interesting, they painted it gray so it kind of looks like El Cap, right? Now, we're talking about like output and people's performance and stuff. This video just ran, it took me 14 seconds to climb that wall. Nowadays, guys are running up that same height wall, and women actually, in 5.6 seconds. It's just amazing, right? I'm glad I competed back then. I would never have been a world <laughs> champion now. So what else are, like these are inputs actually, you know, the culture's behind you, not so much output, but like this is the community of climbers that was in the Camp 4 campground, right? And um, I distinctly remember going into Camp 4 in the early 80s, my first time, I'm a nobody, just another climber, and this guy comes running up to me and he's like, hey, what did you climb today? And I'm like, kind of like a little taken back, like he's getting a little close to me, you know, I'm like, uh, hey, um, uh, we climbed the Nutcracker over on Manure Pile Buttress. Oh, oh really, like, well, um, did you guys all free climb it? And I'm like, well, uh, my buddy got all the pitches free, it's a five pitch route, and I, I slipped on the second pitch. And he's like, oh cool, how long did it take you to do it? And I'm like, oh, you know, nowadays I time everything, but back then I didn't know to do that. So I'm like, well, we started in the morning and finished like an hour ago. It's like, that is so cool. Good job, man. That is so awesome. Then he stood there like that, right? And I'm over here going, oh, he wants me to ask him what he did today, right? <laughs> Hey, what did you do today? You know, and he was just like, ah, bah, 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 bah. we climbed this route over on Lost Arrow Spire, and it was the first ascent, and it was free, and my buddy got it without on site, and all of a sudden he just chattered along. And I just thought that was so cool. He was like, encouraged me and was interested in what I wanted to do, and then he just wanted to blab all about what he did. It was just so innocent and cute. And I'm like, I love this community, right? So, <laughs> as this history, then this is the root history of the nose, right? My favorite route in the world. After that first ascent, the second ascent party did it in what we call alpine style. They did it from the bottom to the top, they didn't go back and forth, and they did it in seven days. The mental barrier had been broken, right? The third ascent party did it in three and a half days. And then by 1975, there was something like just under 30 parties had climbed the nose of El Cap. But this incredible team did nose in a day, NIAD as it's known now. And this is like this feather in your cap. If you're a competent trad climber, you've done nose in a day, NIAD. Totally amazing. Still, like I said, to this day, the average party takes three days. So by the late 80s, it, you know, the time had dropped to nine hours, but it so happened that it was an Austrian and a German that owned the record on our route, and I didn't think that was right. So I, I asked another melting pot boy with a German name, Steve Schneider, to climb with me, and we, our first time ever to climbing together, we got on the base of the nose, I took a 25-foot whipper on the second pitch, I'm surprised, like, Steve didn't repel off and leave. Um, he walked to the base with my mom and dad and this huge video camera on them, right? And to my amazement, teaming up with him, he was the, like John McEnroe of climbing, we did it in eight hours and five minutes. And I was like, yes, I'm gonna be famous in climbing. This is awesome. I've just got the record on the most famous route in the world. <sighs> Less than a week later, Peter Croft and Dave Schultz climbed it in six hours and 40 minutes. Everybody went like this. Oh, these guys are immortal. No one will ever break that time. An hour and 25 minutes faster than the fastest time. This was in the New York Times, the Denver Post, the LA Times, the San Francisco Chronicle. What's the Chapel Hill paper? It's probably in there too. And no mention of Steve or Hans, just these guys had the record, blah, blah, blah. They're the dream team. No one will break this time. 
Well, I believed it. These guys lived in Yosemite. They were the, they were the stuff, right? Well, the next year, 1991, I was competing on the circuit, and I was going up against this young lad. He was like nine years younger than me. He was like 17, 18 years old. Andy Puvel towered over me four or five inches, and he would beat me one month at a comp. I'd beat him at the next month, never at speed, of course, but at difficulty. And um, I, I went up to Andy, and I said, Andy, would you climb outside with me sometime so people don't think we're arch rivals? You know, kind of hunched like this, and he's like, sure, Hans, that'd be great. What do you want to do? I'm like, let's climb the nose. Okay, let's climb the nose. We went to the base of the nose, and just for a lark, because we did believe Dave and Peter were like above everyone else, we timed ourselves, and we did it in six hours and one minute. Yes! Um, I called my mom, um, and I'm going like this, because that was the days when you had real phones. Um, <laughs> And I said, Mom, get ready to buy the paper. I'm going to be on, we just got the record on the nose. Well, less than a week later, <laughs> Peter and Dave, bye-bye <laughs> Hans and Andy, right? This was all over the press. These guys were like, Hans should stay home and get people away from climbing, you know, all this stuff. An hour and 13 minutes, that is so incredible. No one is ever going to break that record, right? I mean, that's just a huge chunk of time. So... Peter, this is a shot of Peter. Uh, he was given a slideshow in Santa Barbara in 1992 in the spring. And I went up to Peter after the show. Hey, Peter, good job. It was great. All those, that's so cool, all that stuff you've done. Hey, um, do you think we could climb sometime together so that people don't think we're arch rivals? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm over here turning red, you know, and like, Peter's just kidding, man. I'll climb with you because, you know, I don't care what people think. So one month later, me and Peter get into you, Sammy, like, well, what do you want to climb? Peter goes, let's climb the nose. So we climbed the route in four hours and 22 minutes. Yes! Whew. Everybody went like this. Hans and Peter, the best guy from each team, got together. No one will ever break that record. Well, I didn't call my mom because I was afraid, like, Peter and Dave the next week would break the record. Um, well, the record lasted a week. It lasted a month. It lasted a year, five years. It lasted nine years. The press was so like, oh, you know, the record gets broken every spring, that there was no press. <laughs> oh, I didn't get the this little postage stamp size picture of me and Peter was like in the little editor's section of Climbing Magazine, so nobody knew who I was. Um, well, nine years later, the incredible Timmy O'Neill and Dean Potter broke the four-hour barrier, 359. I thought that it would be fun and historically consistent if one week later someone broke their record, right? So I called all my buddies and said, hey, let's go up there and get up. And like, all my friends now were married with kids and, and had jobs 50 hours a week. And now that I think of it, so did I, right? Um, my buddy sends me a picture of him training to climb El Cap, right? Jim Herson. <laughs> but this guy's incredible. And he said, you know what? I can't go next week, but the following week I can go. So we went up and we climbed the route to our amazement in 357. <sighs> yes, right? Um, nice. And that's the end of my story. Uh, so, am I at 15 minutes yet? No. Um, so, Dean and Timmy did not have that historical perspective we did. They didn't wait a week. A couple days later, they did it in 324. <laughs> Everybody went like this. This is the new dream team. No one will ever break that record, right? No one will ever break that record. And I heard this before, you know, no one will break the four minute mile. Uh, sure, people do. Um, the following year, my good friend, Yuji Hirayama, showed up in town. And he's not per se a speed climber, but he's a world champion free climber. And I coaxed him into climbing the nose with me. We did it in 327 our first time. And those asterisks there are that um, we passed seven parties. And I wrote the book on speed climbing. On like, and there's a whole chapter dedicated to the art of passing, right? And you have to stop and you have to talk to people and ask permission to pass, right? So I thought we should get a minute handicap per person we passed. Um, that didn't really work. So the following week, me and Yuji tried again. I went back to work, came up, and um, there was no one on the route. And he had some friends go to the top and shoot video of that. So I'm just going to show you a quick clip of what it looks like looking down 3,000 feet on somebody climbing. So let's talk about human output. Yuji has climbed 2,900 feet very hard climbing and here he is a hundred feet from the top and he's just motoring along on this fairly difficult climb. For those that are climbers it's a 510 crack. 
super amazing there. If you are prone to motion sickness, there should be some bags under your seat here because we're going to pan out uh, what it looks like looking down this gigantic face, right? Just stunning and amazing. This is his buddy Kenji jumping out to take photos of him. So all of you, you can hike to the top and lean over like this next time you go to Yosemite. The week before we did it in 327, the record was 324. This week we did it in 248. <laughs> and, and we got in the newspaper, it was kind of nice. Yuji not only is a world-class climber, he's an incredibly funny and good friend. Um, we lost the audio on this, but it was in Japanese anyway, so we have some subtitles. Um, I'm going to let this run here, hopefully. Yeah, I don't have to translate, right? Because we've lost the audio, but it's good. We have the text under there. Yuji, incredible, incredible guy, four times world champion, 12 times world cup climber. <laughs> and I'm just about as nutty as him, so he's willing to climb with me, right? Well, this was fantastic. We got on the cover of the San Francisco Chronicle. I got my big hairdo picture on top of rock and ice. Um, I can't tell you how many shows I've done. People, where's Hans, where's Hans? And I'm like, look, it's me, I cut my hair. Um, and TEDx even got on the front of San Francisco Chronicle. F wonderful. This is my um, little tech talk picture, really. Um, it's nice to get your cover and get recommend, you know, recognized by your community, but what was incredible to me is that in 1988, 15 years earlier, I walked to the base of El Cap in, by headlamp in the morning at 5 a.m., and I got on the route with my good college roommate, Mike Lopez. We climbed for 12 hours, and after 12 hours of climbing, it started getting dark, and we got to right there. Me and Yuji, 15 years later, took 16 minutes to go that same distance. Totally incredible to me that I could have failed that much. Actually, me and Mike um, looked at our water supply and food supply and were like, we're not going to make it. We repelled down tails between our legs and went back to school for a year. Um, young and strong, but um, not strong enough heads up. So our newspaper article that came out on us, all this attention to me and Yuji, started attracting professional climbers. Thomas and Alexander Uber had a million dollar filming budget to come and get the record on the nose. And I went down and gave him my CD set on how to climb the nose faster. Little did I know that Germans don't take advice very well. Um, <coughs> but they wanted to get my kids drinking beer, which was kind of funny. Um, and there's a, a short film about them on Real Rock Tour, and I'm just going to play it because it, it describes their character better than anything I could say. In 2007, the nose race was shaken up by German climbing stars Alex and Tomas Huber. First, we thought speed climbing is a stupid thing, or it's an American thing. I don't want to say American and, and it's the same like stupid, but... But I just did. It's, we don't like it. But we found out that it's real sport. And we like sports and uh, of course we are ambitious and we want to do this. So these guys were incredible. They spent a million dollars on this documentary, won all these awards. They didn't get the record. Um, the year after the documentary came out, they came back and they actually got the record. Um, Alexander sent me this photo of them on top with the new record, 245. They beat us. They actually beat us by 30 seconds, and they went three days later and beat themselves by three minutes. So super proud. And of course, me and Yuji had to go back. Um, so I'm just going to play footage of that. Um, but before me and Yuji went back, you know, I really believe that, like, this whole thing of no one will ever beat that time. It's, you know, no one will break a four-minute mile. Of course they will. I wagered my friends a hundred bucks that the Ubers or someone would break me and Yuji's record. And this is the check I got from my friend. He actually sent me a hundred bucks. I won because the Uber brothers broke my record. I used the money to buy these guys beer as a celebration. It wasn't enough, of course, but... Um, <laughs> With the beer, I pried out of them all the little tricks and stuff that they did, and I used that for me and Yuji. Me and Yuji went back the following spring, and here's us going for it with the crowd's help. Ooh, there we go. And racing for the final tree, right, to hit the watch. I'm so exhausted from trying to keep up with Yuji that I can barely talk, so I can't tell him what the time was. 243, 33. Ah! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> <sighs> 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 
this. Yeah. What time did you get, hon? You like that? So I told you, like, one thing about Yosemite, it's a crazy wild place, but you can drive your car into El Cap Meadow and you can walk 15 minutes to the base of this 3,000 foot wall. Um, it's a wild place, but this day there was hundreds of people there and it was like NASCAR when we came down. Like, No way, they're never going to break that record, right? <laughs> so um, that's my output. That's the adventures I've been on, um, my climbing adventures. Super psyched to share them with you guys. This is one of the reasons that I have been able to get them. I've had people empower me, not allow me, but empower me, um, the people around me, to go and do these climbs, right? Um, I, it's, it's the end kind of here, but not the end, is that what are my outputs? Are they things that were impossible and I made them possible? Or are they just things that were not done yet? I like that, not done yet. Um, don't say things are impossible, they're just not done yet. You folks there in the audience, you know the other speakers asked you to look around at you, but you've done something I bet that I haven't done yet, and you've probably done something that I can't do, and you've probably done something that other people might think is impossible for them to do. Um, I would say that I don't know, maybe you think you could never do what I did here up on these big rocks and stuff, but surround yourself with people that are great. In, and the inputs matter, right? We talked about the food earlier today. Give yourself great food input. Give yourself a great community around you that's positive people, and your output will be awesome. I'm going to steal the words in closing from the kids. You better watch out. You're going to break that record. Thanks. <laughs>